there's a, a famous exercise that diplomacy students do. And it has to do with these two teams, and each team has their orders, and they each need to get all of this very important crop. One of them has to cure a disease which will wipe out their country, and the other one has to feed their population. And if they don't get all of the crop, their country will die. And you can probably guess this being a good American diplomatic process, that in the end, if they keep from having conflict and they have good discussion, they exchange information, they understand that actually one of them needs the flowers and one of them needs the stems and we can all just live happily ever after and it's win-win. NATO works a lot like that. People work every day, you meet. Yes, it's, it's hard security, you're building national defense systems, but every country has a veto, you have to work together you have to be able to, to build these consensuses over time. We've actually seen this happening recently between uh, Sweden, Finland, and Turkey, right? Hard positions, little negotiation, in the end they find a solution. And really at the end of the Cold War, one of NATO's great innovations was projecting this process out into former adversaries in the Warsaw Pact in a region that had been highly unstable for many decades, and particularly in the interwar period. And that, through partnership for peace, and then when some of those countries said, we actually want to be members through NATO membership and NATO enlargement, transformed the continent. The story of NATO-Ukraine relations goes in that same story. It's it's got more right steps and left steps. There are various issues that, that have come up, but it's basically this flowers exercise, how to get to win-win, you know, with lots of different interests involved. The relationship with Russia, and especially the Russia-Ukraine relationship, is not that story. The conflicts that are um, happening in Russia, Russia's place in, sorry, I need to, to scroll a little bit here. Um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is not some wrong step in the win-win game. It's not because someone made a wrong diplomatic signal. It's because tectonic forces, historical forces, that are fundamentally contradictory are driving conflict. There's not an easy win-win solution. We're not going to discover that one of us needs the flowers and one of us needs the stems. When Putin looks at Ukraine and says it's the anti-Russia, he doesn't just mean that it's a project against Russia. He means that it's anti-matter, that its mere presence is destructive for his regime. Because when what Putin did in the early 2000s is he looked around at a country that was had for 10 years sort of been haltingly going through a process of, of change, of marketization, of demonopolization, and he said, I'm going to pick up all the pieces. I'm going to sew them back together. I'm going to make the vertical of power. I'm going to tell Russians that, that there's a strong arm in charge now, and everyone's going to listen to me. Power is back. I'm going to reestablish the monopoly. Ukraine does not work that way. Ukraine is a highly demonopolized country. It has regional differences, as we saw. It has religious differences. It has um, linguistic and ethnic differences. There are different financial clans. There are different political groups. They've had competitive elections now for 20 years. In the time when Russia, they've had one president. Well, they've, they've had, okay, they've had 30 years of, of, of elections. 20 years have been very competitive. Um, and so this direction that Putin has taken Russia, this re-monopolization of Russia, has created a situation in which Ukraine is a mortal threat to his regime. Because if the Russian people, every one of whom 
who has a brother, an in-law, a cousin who lives in Ukraine, were to take that model of how to operate as a society, they would not tolerate what is happening. And so as he looks at the situation, as he looks at, at the stresses on his system, as he looks at um, succession, who's coming after him, how long he's going to be in place, his, he looks at Ukraine and he says, I have to get rid of that. It's the exact same calculation that Stalin had when he decided to starve millions of Ukrainians to death in the 1930s. And I have absolutely no, um, in his speech before the invasion, Putin made it perfectly clear that the freedom given to the various republics in the early Soviet Union by Lenin was a mistake and that Stalin's correction was proper. We look today at what happens in Ukraine. We look at the destruction that's happening. That isn't a feature. It isn't a bug. It's a feature. If eastern Ukraine is devastated, that is just fine by Putin. And it's important that we understand these kinds of stark realities that we don't tend to face in America. Um, as Putin came to power, and as the pressure grew on then President Kuchma, Ukraine turned to NATO. And there have really been three constituencies, well, three and a half constituencies for NATO membership in Ukraine. The first one is the armed forces, who worked with NATO in partnership for peace, in exercises, all the way starting in the early 90s. By, 19, by, by 2004, 20,000 military personnel had served side by side with NATO officers and, and, and soldiers. That had a fundamentally transformative effect on the Ukrainian armed forces. And in the Orange Revolution that Professor Robertson spoke about in 2004, Yanukovych tried to get the armed forces to crush the rebellion, and they refused. One of the critical people who refused, whose unit is actually based where, in the town where the mayor, who we'll speak later, is from, has just finished the defense of Kiev. So in 2004, he refused to crush the revolution. He just finished the defense of Kiev, has been named a hero of Ukraine, and given a fourth star. So the legacy of those people who worked side by side with NATO, who saw a new professional vision of what it meant to be a soldier in a democracy, that continues through today. The second group is the security community, kind of the wider people, the national security, the police, and they also saw, not in the same way, not with the same contact, but beginning in the 2000s, NATO was their way to reform, to have a police force, a security system that would match an intelligence system that would match the needs of a democracy. The third group were the people. Now, the people had grown up in a society where NATO was considered the enemy. And there was a lot of skepticism. So for them, they wanted to go west, and it was the EU, not NATO. I wasn't very popular when I was in, uh, um, at least not my, not my label, when I was in Kiev. But people wanted to go to the EU. They wanted to live better. They wanted a democracy. And so the people were behind the same general direction. And as, and as you saw in, in the, uh, the polling data, when Russia finally invaded in 2014, it began a transformation of how Ukrainians thought about NATO and defense. The final group is the elites. And the elites have, frankly, for too long in Ukraine, been comfortable in the gray zone. They wanted to join, Kuchma wanted to join NATO to be protected from Russia from the sharks, but he didn't want to, he still wanted to do business in the post-Soviet way. And those tendencies, there are still too many of those within the elites. I think President Zelensky is a transformative figure, but so many of the people around him and so many of the elites 
are going to have um, are going to have challenges refocusing their minds on how to do business in a transparent society um, moving forward. The, as we look at the war then, it's really been both a, a driver, the NATO-Ukraine relationship has driven some factors in the war and responded to them. In effect, this operational cooperation, this training, this military uh, relationship intensified deeply in 2014 after Russia took Crimea and the Donbass War started. And tens of thousands of Ukrainians, soldiers, have gone through small unit training with allied US, Canadian, British, other allies, um, trainers. If you look at the results of the war, if you look at the early war, the combination of that small unit training independent thinking, Ukrainians' own very independent, demonopolized culture. So the, the saying is where you find, where there are two Ukrainians, you find three hetman, right? So if you have a small unit and you're in Ukraine, you don't wait for orders. You go out, you find a logistics train, you, you take action. And the combination of, of that culture and the NATO training and the small unit weapons, I think, made a difference, substantial difference in, in helping Ukraine with an amazingly courageous defense, particularly in the early, the early days of the war. And by doing that, I think Ukraine's armed forces has transformed our understanding of what they can do. And as that confidence is built, you've seen more and more sophistication in what we're willing to do the weapons we're sharing, the intelligence we're sharing, the training we're sharing, to the point that now, in effect, at a military level, um, Ukraine is operating almost as a NATO member. Not with NATO forces in the country, but with full support from the alliance. And that really is an amazing transformation in a very short time. It goes to show the, the latent strength of, of that relationship. Um, the People, I think, as I said before, people have also turned decisively toward the West. And although there was an, in early time this sense of you need to do more, why aren't you helping us more, I, I think Ukrainians have begun to understand that the West has a certain tempo. They see the process. They see the increase. There is patience there. Um, it's painful because every slow step we take Everything we don't do means more cities bombed, more people dying, more refugees. And, and I think um, in this sense, the personal example of President, uh, President Zelensky has been important in staying in place, in, in um, not turning bitter, in having patience, but also in setting an example. And I think here one of the critical things that we are now learning is how to deal with this existential threat of nuclear war, which we've lived with and we've thought about and we've created structures about for a long time, but Russia hasn't looked at it the same way as we have. And we're realizing that in the end, this idea we've had that you know, we're kind of operating under doom and at any moment that, that Putin can push the button and end it all isn't reality that he has fundamental constraints that he works under. And in the end, if he tried to push the button, it's probably, or gave the order, it's probably the last order he would give. Because that would be the last straw for people around him. And then the final thing, I think, um, looking forward, is it's important for us to be able to continue this operational cooperation, um, to realize that in the current situation, peace, and there'll be a negotiated peace at some time, but it will be won on the battlefield. And that will be won on the basis of our continuing support and Ukrainian valor. Um, our engagement during this time is crucial for what comes after. Because Ukraine, when the war ends, or if it goes into a frozen conflict, is going to have a time, enter a time of risk.
of possible instability, of people being disappointed, of, of the, the adrenaline dropping. And at that point, the connection that the West has, both from having made contributions, of having been there with them, and those personal connections, the kinds of things that happen in city partnerships, are going to be absolutely essential to helping to stabilize um, Ukrainians as they look to the future and as they try to rebuild. And they'll also be incredibly important in what may be the next step. Because there is a real possibility that Russia, faced with a military failure, will have a political crisis. It could even balkanize. We have to, as a West, stop being afraid of that. If it's going to happen, we can't stop it. We can be ready for it. We can try to reach out and help those people in those spaces that are trying to do the right thing. And we can work with countries near Russia, including Ukraine, to help them project stability into their neighborhood the way that we did at the end of the Cold War. And that will be a tremendous act of, of faith and forgiveness on the part of Ukrainians at some point. They may be faced with, the, with, with having to look across the border at Belgorod or Kursk, see people starving, see civil war starting, and say, I'm going to not think about what those people did to me a few years ago. I'm going to still reach out to them. I'm going to try to stabilize my neighborhood. And, and I think in, in that looking forward, those relationships that we build, that strength we can give, those, that personal contact will be absolutely essential in not only winning the war, but also winning the peace that comes after. So thank you very much. It's a real honor to be here. Thank you, Mr. Green.